So, so question one, question one is uh, very straightforward. It is would love to know a bit of your story before uh, Foundry Group. Of course, I know a little bit of the professional bio, but the whole story would be would be fascinating. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, my background is as follows. I uh, I went. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My dad was a doctor, and my mom was an artist. Um, I was interested in computers at a young age. For my bar mitzvah, I used my money that I got and bought an Apple II computer. Uh, so I was always playing around with computers. I uh, went to MIT uh, for college. So I lived in Boston starting in 1983. Um, had a couple of failed efforts at getting companies up and running while I was in school. And then eventually started my first business with a partner uh, called Feld Technologies. Uh, we started that company in 1987. Uh, it was self-funded, so we had 10 bucks, and that was the money that went into the company. Um, we built a business over seven years. Uh, it had to be cash flow positive because we had no money. And, um, you know, we made money every month. And eventually, in 1993, sold it to a public company. It was about a 20-person, $2 million a year business at that time. And What did you do? It was a software consulting business. So we wrote custom software for small and medium-sized companies, a lot in the Boston area, but some across the country. And we did PC-based applications at a time where client-server was still new. Um, people were, or it was before client-servers when we got started, writing database applications. Most people didn't really know how to build PC-based software. So we took a very computer science approach to it and built some pretty robust applications um, sort of early on in the life of uh, the personal computer. That business got bought by a public company that was a very large company, or grew to be a very large company. We were the sixth or seventh of 40 acquisitions. Uh, and I worked with that company, uh, reporting to the two co-chairmen. We, as a company, we bought a larger version of my company, and the guy that was the CEO of that company ended up running all the consulting business. Uh, I worked with the uh, two co-chairmen on M&A stuff and technology strategy and a variety of things like that. And then um, started making angel investments in 1994 when I was still in Boston and invested in a bunch of companies early on in the life of the commercial internet. Did about 40 angel investments. Joined up with some uh, folks in 97 and started a venture firm that eventually became Obvious Venture Capital. Uh, continued to start some companies but did a lot of uh, investments during that period of time and eventually uh, uh, Mobius grew, had a lot of success early on, then had uh, the internet bubble was very tough on Mobius. Uh, we still manage, my partners and I, Foundry Group, still manage the remaining Mobius portfolio. There's still a number of companies that are active, uh, but my three partners and I started Foundry Group in 2007 uh, and have been investing in early stage software internet companies through Foundry since then. We've got about 45 investments all around the U.S. and um, having fun doing it. So... Okay, so many questions, but firstly, wh why why the switch from uh, entrepreneur to VC? So, very different game. Yeah, I never really liked being CEO. So, I was CEO for seven years. I was probably a pretty good CEO because we built a nice company, but I didn't love it. Uh, and when I started investing as an angel investor, I had a ton of fun as an early stage angel investor. I really liked working with uh, CEOs and with the entrepreneurs, but I also really liked not being the one that was running the company day to day. Okay. And um, as I did more and more of that, eventually, you know, it sort of turned into a venture capital activity. But I think it took me a while to really separate the two constructs, because even when I was doing venture capital, I was still starting companies. And as chairman was essentially providing a lot of leadership and running parts yeah. of the company, which, you know, wasn't really until I got to the other side of it and decided, no, nope, you know, I really have to choose. I can either be the entrepreneur, or be the investor and chose, decided to choose being the investor. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so I guess it's it's nice to sort of understand the more, uh, I guess, very professional side of things, right? What what has been, what have been some of the defining moments? I mean, there have been quite a few switches here. One is, uh, of course, selling your company, starting your company. Uh, there's all this. Well, what have been some of some of the big defining moments? I think the defining moments for me are. Uh, Obviously, selling that first company was pretty substantial and, and impactful. 
we really hadn't ever thought about selling the business. So it was kind of an accident that somebody found us to buy our company. Okay. The two guys that I worked for were excellent entrepreneurs and have been extraordinary mentors of mine, uh, Len Fassler and Jerry Pock, just two people I learned an enormous amount from in that period and you know, continue to, uh, every time I interact with Len, uh, learn things from him. So it's just, it, that's been a great relationship. Another was my move to Boulder. Uh, my wife, Amy, a couple of months before I turned 30, told me she was moving to Boulder and I could come with her. And so we didn't know anybody in Boulder. We just moved to Boulder randomly. We knew it was a nice place. We've been here, but it ended up being a spectacular place to build life and, and, and live our life. So that was pretty important. Um, I think uh, the, the 1999-2000 time period on the positive side and the 2001-2002 time period on the negative side were incredibly impactful because they were uh, extraordinarily busy times. And uh, on the upside of it, it was very sort of chaotic, obviously very positive and fun and invigorating. But the downside was excruciating. And sort of the juxtaposition of those two really reinforced the importance of building substantial companies, um, you know, being in it for sort of a longer, a longer view than just whatever the short term money dynamic was. I learned a lot about public markets. I learned a lot about sort of the sentiment of individuals, you know, in the downside of the curve when everybody got crushed, you really <laughs> learned who was into it because they were excited about creating and building companies. Yeah. Just trying to make a buck. So that was powerful. And then, I think many of the experiences that sort of led out of Mobius and led into Foundry sort of 2005 to 2007 um, formed a lot of our deeply held beliefs at Foundry Group that my partners and I shared. We all worked together at Mobius. We'd all had the experiences and, you know, from different vantage points, but through that period of time. And I think one of the key things that we, uh, we really decided was not to try to grow, was just to create a firm that was just the four of us and to be okay. really focused on doing what we were great at and, Doing, doing things that we loved with people that we really enjoyed working with and not worrying about too much of the other stuff. Okay. Um, you know, I, 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 I had a bunch of themes that I had. So one of them now that you've touched on is, is why Boulder? And, and how, Okay. So, of course, you said it, it, it almost happened by accident, but, but, but why of all places? And, then, and I know you've been uh, working very hard on building a community of entrepreneurs there. So, so well, what's the story there? So again, Boulder was, was random. Amy and I wanted to move somewhere other than Boston. Boston wasn't home. Um, I grew up in Dallas and she grew up in Alaska. And um, Boston uh, was very good to us, but we decided to move somewhere. I spent a lot of time on the West Coast, both Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I didn't really want to live in any of those three cities. And so, you know, we chose a place that was, I wanted to live in a smaller city, but one that was sort of connected to a larger city. Okay. Um, I also was traveling a lot East Coast, West Coast, so being in the center of the country made sense. Okay. And we moved to Boulder with the idea that if we didn't like it, we'd just try something else. And, you know, we picked a place that we thought we'd really like as our starting point, but we didn't have any preconceived notion that it was going to be the right place. Yeah. And, you know, again, six months in, it was phenomenal. So... Uh, you know, we never looked back and have been here ever since. So I think that there was a little bit of thought that went into it, mostly from the standpoint of, you know, looking at places that we knew that were, you know, had either mountains or ocean and were smart and were liberal places and kind of, you know, places that we would feel comfortable with. And there weren't that many of them that weren't on either the West Coast or the East Coast. We also didn't really want to be on the West Coast or the East Coast. So that was part of the drive. Holy. So that, this, that's how that's a, that, that's quite a story. And, and then, then two questions. So how did you convince all your partners to move with you is one. And, and, how, and was there already a community of entrepreneurs in Boulder or how, how did this come about? In terms of my partners, um, the, my three partners, when we, joined, when we started Foundry in 2007, one of them uh, uh, had been living in Boulder already. Seth uh, had worked with me and had lived here for a long time. He moved here in the 90s. The other two, Ryan and Jason, were both in the Bay Area. And, you know, we had long conversations, and they had to make a commitment to move here uh, as part of us forming this firm together. When I say they had to make a commitment, part of the discussion was uh, I really didn't want to have a distributed organization. I had been the satellite office for Mobius. I had to go to California all the time. And it was just really hard, and I just didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah. And um, 
you know, it wasn't that they had to make a commitment of moving to show their commitment around family. Quite the yeah. opposite. It was that it was a big, uh, it was a big commitment on their part to make the move. Yeah. And, um, you know, they both did it with, uh, you know, with vigor, and and uh, it's been great. I think you know they they maintain deep roots in the valley. Um, you know, my partner Ryan has a house out there still and spends a lot of time there. His, his wife Catherine loves it there, but they also are of Boulder and part of Boulder and very involved here. And, uh, you know, Jason's really, uh, this has been a great place for him. He's loved this town and he's, you know, he's, he's made himself a presence here. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it was one of those things where there's a lot of conversation about, we want to be together. We want to have our families together. We want to have lives together. We don't want to be dispersed and separated. That was something that was important to us. That's, that's piece one. So Boulder's always had um, a lot of entrepreneurial activity dating way back for before I was here. The natural foods industry essentially was created in Boulder. Many of the early companies, Celestial Seasonings is one that many people know about. About half of Whole Foods was two companies that were started here, Wild Oats and Alfalfa's. Um, White Wave, which makes soy milk, Mellon by Dean was here, okay. lots and lots of other companies like that. And then um, in this area, you always had a lot of storage and telecommunications. So companies like Storage Tech and Exabyte, sort of in the area, <clears throat> a lot of data services businesses. So there was a lot of software engineering talent uh, in and around Boulder. Okay. Uh, it's a very smart community. It's a college town, so about 25% of the population is, is affiliated with the university. Yeah. Three national labs, so there's lots of PhDs here. And then there's a lot of hippies here. So there's a lot of people who sort of, you know, they're living their life the way they want to live their life rather than the way somebody else thinks they should live their life. <laughs> and that's been very uh, that's been very satisfying, a very satisfying way to be. Um, and, you know, from that has emerged, I think, a real commitment to community, a real commitment to doing something that is durable. Uh, the software internet community here is extraordinary, and it's a function of a whole bunch of leadership and a whole bunch of different people who participate in it very actively. It's very satisfying. I don't know. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So I think I think a couple more questions on, on sort of the, the story front. Um, one is, who are I, – I know your dad's a big role model. I've, I've, I've read – uh, a few of your posts, but, but it would be nice to think about who are the who were the big role models who are uh, still. So a handful. Uh, my dad, obviously, I've written about that a lot. I've learned an enormous amount from him, and he's been one of my great mentors. Uh, my uncle, my dad's brother Charlie Feld, has also been a huge mentor of mine, as well as a business partner. He and I have worked together over the years on numerous things, and I've learned an enormous amount from him. <clears throat> he's a very successful CIO, so. In his career arc, when he was really uh, involved in, in uh, you know, running large uh, tech infrastructure companies like Frito Lay, he was very inclusive of me when I was a teenager. Okay. Uh, and in college and early on, it felt technologies and exposing me to you know the technology companies and letting me come when he would be in Boston, letting me come to meetings at Digital or going to meetings at, at Lotus or wherever else he was. Uh, I mentioned Len Fassler earlier. Len was one of the two guys that bought my first company, and he and I. Uh, have worked closely together, had a, a number of companies, some successful, some not. Um, but he's been an incredible, incredible mentor uh, and, and friend uh, and partner uh, in, in many different activities. Uh, you know, I have uh, a lot of uh, emotional, uh, I have no personal relationship, but a lot of emotional loyalty uh, and intellectual uh, uh, loyalty to Warren Buffett. I love the way that uh, Warren <laughs> articulates how he thinks about business and how he thinks about what he does. I mean, role model, I'm not sure because I do very different things, but yeah. there's a lot of pieces in his style and his approach to things that I'm very, uh, you know, I have deep respect for. Um, and then uh, Yoda, who I would say is, you know, one of the, one of the most influential uh, uh, non-humans uh, on my, on my arc. You know, I think that the, the style and character of Yoda, uh, the understatedness of him, but you know his ability to be a total badass with a lightsaber, um, and his uh, his willingness to continue to invest in uh, in, in the next generation of people uh, and of leaders is something that I, I aspire to when I look back on my long, uh, hopefully very long life. Uh, <laughs> don't feel pulled up. Hello, that's fascinating. Oh, so at least I got my discus avatar right. Uh, <laughs> 
I got lots of Yodas. My Yoda sort of hangs around everywhere. Oh no, that that's a, that's amazing. That's amazing. So so I, I guess the question is now uh, you you mentioned forty six com- companies, right? Found, that Foundry manages. 45, 46. Yeah, 45, 46, and then a few from Mobius Capital. This is, a, these are, I mean, there's, there's quite a few um, uh, companies, I guess, and, and, and things you do that must keep you very busy. But, but what, what is it? What is something that really inspires you? What, what, what makes you get up out of bed in the morning, all energized? Well, I, I mean, it's very, very simple. I love working with people who are creating new things. So I love the energy and the process and the exploration of starting with an idea and creating product from the idea. And the product can be software. The product can be uh, uh, things like the Sphero. Uh, right? Yes. You know, a company that came through Techstars. It's a, uh, it says part ball, part robot, all fun, but it's a ball that you control with your smartphone. And, you know, bringing that product from idea through concept, through the creation of it, through them releasing it, manufacturing it, getting it into people's hands. It's just awesome, the whole experience. Um, you know, being involved with companies that, that go on, you know, incredible ramps. I mean, I was, uh, you know, Zynga would be a great example that many people know about. I was involved with Zynga. We made our investment when they had about 10 people or so in the company. I mean, those are just incredibly satisfying experiences. Not just the outcome, but the actual process of working with the entrepreneurs and the early people in the companies to try to do something really special. So I, that, that inspires me, and I get it lots of levels. I get it through the 45 companies we've invested in through Techstar, or through a founder group. I get it through the hundreds of companies that we've invested in through Techstars, you know, which I, I've been involved in from the very beginning. Um, and then we're very supportive of many other companies and many other people who we're not investors in. So we try to be, as myself and my partners, try to be very available to any entrepreneur that wants to engage with us. There's many, many things that we can't do much to be helpful with, but if we can, we will. Okay. And so, so, so today, is, today is one of those days, right? It's a big day in the tech industry, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I read I read something, and then there's of course a lot of news, a lot of noise about Facebook going on over the past many, many, many days. Uh, but for me, for me, the most interesting thing is fundamentally the world has changed. We have a company that's a hundred billion in market cap, uh, you know, doing something very different from say GE, which is you know market leader in all these real world things. So I know you have a lot of views on this. You have a view on uh, robots. Uh, that the machines taking over the world, etc. Yeah, I'd love to sort of get a view on on, on on where you think the world is now, and 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 what is it gonna, in your view, crystal ball? Uh, where what are we going towards? Well, uh, so I'll answer the first, the, side, the end first. I mean, I, I I believe, and I say this very publicly, I believe that the machines have already taken over, and I don't. I don't have a post-apocalyptic future view. I I believe that humans and machines are interdependent from here on out in civilization as we know it. And I think the machines are our friends, and we should view them as such. You know, people, humans have been trying to kill humans ever since the beginning of time. So, you know, the anthropomorphism of the machine trying to kill humans and eradicate the human species, if that happens, it probably doesn't matter. They're going to win. So kind of my view is don't worry about that scenario. Let's worry about the scenario where it's a a human-enhanced computer future, computer-enhanced human future, and, you know, let's continue to work and and innovate and and create amazing things with the machines that enhance our lives on this planet as humans and recognize that there are some things about us as humans that are uniquely ours and there are some things about the intersection point between us and machines that – we don't actually understand in any way, shape, or form because if you think about the evolution of the machines, right now, you know, there aren't a lot of biological computers yet, but we're starting to have a lot of innovation on that curve. And sort of the intersection of a biological form and a machine is starting to become very important. So whether you think about it abstractly as simply sort of software and your access or lens to it via, you know, the browser or mobile phone, or you actually think about it as things that are physically implanted in the body or encapsulate the body, or you think about it as an even deeper uh, interplay between man and machine in terms of physiology, I think the next 50 years uh, on this vector are going to be just mind-blowing. And I think it's awesome to be in the middle of it. I think it's a phenomenal time to be alive. 
Uh, I think, you know, communication uh, and, and, and governance, whether it's government or companies, are shifting dramatically, or any other social structure, shifting dramatically from hierarchies to a network. And that reflects also the lot dynamics of how machines interact with each other. And, you know, I think the ability for, you know, for example, for us to have this conversation, for you to record it, for you to broadcast it to whomever you want, uh, there was no friction to set it up. I sat down on my computer, we clicked a couple of buttons, and boom. Uh, I mean, you know, go back in time 40 years, and this is this would have been the science fiction of 40 years ago. True. And they might not have got the timing exactly right. And even today, you know, we bitch and moan, gosh, I have to be in front of my computer. I was in my car, uh, you know, I was late to this because I was in my car because I was at another thing, you know, 20 minutes away from here. I should have just been able to start while I was driving in my car, I should have pressed the button, my car should have driven itself, and we should have started having our conversation. Yes, yeah, so you can see how that's, you know, whether you whether you watch Minority Report over and over again, <laughs> and do that as 2054, or, you know, you, you keep extrapolating from today. We're on that trajectory, and, you know, uh, more and more and more amazing companies are going to emerge. And in terms of what those companies are worth and what the market values are and how... You know, it, it, it evolves continually, hmm. and I'm not going to predict. I have no interest, actually, in predicting the future of that. Um, what I do know is I want to be uh, involved and as helpful as I can in the ecosystem around the creation of those, knowing that some will be very, very successful and others won't. Makes absolute sense. So it's, it's close to 20 minutes. So I have I have a couple more questions. Um, one is actually around marathons. I know, I know it's a big goal. I know, I know you're looking to run a marathon in all 50 states. How did that happen? Uh, well, what, what have been sort of the biggest learnings from that journey? Yeah, well, the stimulus for it was I was fat, and um, okay. uh, I, was, I was a skinny kid. I weighed about 170 in college, between 170 and 180. I got up to the 200s after college, and sort of at the peak of the internet bubble, I was probably about 240. Okay. So I gained a lot of weight. I gained it all in my belly and my ass. So I look like this, you know, I look like Homer Simpson. You know, like my belly went like this and my ass went like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I look at myself in the mirror every now and then for a short period as far I possibly could because, and you have your body self-image. I still thought of myself as somebody who weighed 170 pounds. Um, so one motivation was just to, to, to start to in, in integrate fitness into my, into my routine more. And there were some other drivers behind that. I was struggling with gout. Um, and, you know, losing weight and changing my diet would help with that. So it turned out that, that I solved gout by taking medicine instead of through, through exercise. But it set me on a course uh, that was important. And part of that was I wanted to have a big goal. And I came up with the goal. I, I always liked to run. I ran a lot when I was in high school and a little bit in college. And so I came up with this goal of running a marathon in every state. And, uh, you know, just the act of running that first marathon was quite substantial. But... The long art goal of I'm going to do 50 of these uh, was powerful. Now I've done 21 now, and I I definitely haven't. I don't think you ever really master something like the marathon because you always have different things you can learn and different things you can do. But I understand what it is now. So having done 21 of them, you know, I'm confident that unless I really injure myself, I'll always finish. And I don't run them for time. I run them to do them and for the experience. Although you know sometimes I feel in better shape than others, so I'll run harder. Um, and uh, my wife and I have a great time exploring the U.S. because we usually make a three- or four-day weekend <laughs> out of any marathon that we're doing and just sort of explore whatever city we're in. So that's that. Uh, I also, you know, running has really become a, a source of meditation for me. So it gives me a chance to be alone with my thoughts, to be away from everybody else. I run, I like to describe it as running naked. I don't listen to music. Um, I just, I like to run alone. I don't really enjoy running with other people that much, although I do sometimes. But most of the time I'm alone. And it's just a chance for me to be with myself and with my thoughts and, you know, get both the physical activity, but also the emotional and spiritual activity of that. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. Uh, the last question before the last question is, uh, is uh, you know, I, I know, at least I gather from what I've read is, you know, you have a lot of little productivity routines uh, that sort of keep you uh, sane, I think, with all the traveling and everything. What are some of these? Uh, what are some of these little, little, little uh, things that you have in place? Well, I, yeah, there's a bunch that are tactical, uh, and then and some of the tactical ones don't work, and so I evolve them all the time. Um, you know, probably the the simple ones to, uh, to 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 rattle off quickly. One is 
I try to get up at five o'clock every morning uh, during the week. On the weekends, I don't, but during the week, no matter where I am. And uh, I try to have time from five to nine that's unscheduled. So, you know, I get up at five, I make a cup of coffee, I sit in front of my computer, I catch up on email from the day before, I write a blog post. Um, I, I have a daily information routine where I go to a couple of websites and look at whatever information I want to get for the day. And I do that till nine, and then I go for a run. If I go running that day, that's when I work out. From about nine to six, I tend to be very scheduled. So I don't do random phone calls. Uh, you know, I, my phone doesn't ever ring uh, during the day. I spent the whole day with me. It might ring three or four times. My wife, Amy, would call me a couple of times. Maybe I get a call from a CEO of a company that just really wanted to get in touch with me about something. But very, very few other, because I push everything else to a schedule, as you've experienced. Yes. So I'm very scheduled throughout the day, and I tend to run pretty close to schedule. Sometimes I get 10 or 15 minutes off throughout the day, but... Um, my assistant Kelly is very good at moving stuff around so that if I'm behind, I have some buffer. I schedule everything in 30 minute increments. So I always, almost always have extra time because very few things take 30 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, I have a lot of five or 10 minute phone calls and I'll have 20 or 15 minutes to catch up, to make a call to somebody or to do something, or if I need to read something or talk to someone or just sit and work on catching up on email or whatever throughout the day. And then I generally, in the evenings, try to either be actively engaged from, you know, 6 to 8 or 9 when I'm home, uh, dinner with entrepreneurs at an event, you know, dinner with my partners, something around dinner, but around dinner and a work activity three or four nights a week. If I'm on the road, it's every night. And if it's on the road, it tends to be later. Uh, and, but then I try to get home. Uh, because I try to get home to get to bed by, you know, 9.30, 10, 10.30 at the latest and have a little time with Amy. So that's kind of the arc of the day. And then throughout it, you know, I do things like Amy and I have a routine we call four minutes in the morning. So uh, when she wakes up, she wakes up an hour, hour and a half after me. I stop what I'm doing and we immediately spend just four minutes together. Just good morning. Like just hanging out, having coffee, being together. Uh, once a month, uh, on the first day of every month, we have something we call life dinner. So we're going to be in Iceland on the first uh, next uh, this month. And, you know, just the two of us, we schedule dinner in a nice restaurant. We talk about the previous month and the next month and sort of what's going on. Um, you know, so I built a bunch of these types of, of things into my routines. That is really cool. Uh, no, I, I did read, I remember reading about the four minutes. I thought that was that was incredibly cool. Final question, uh, and it is the final question. The, you know, the, the readers here are, 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 you know, you have a mix of people, but essentially, the again, the whole idea of doing this is to inspire leaders. And, and, and by leaders, I don't mean, you know, big CEOs necessarily, right? But we lead ourselves at the very least and lead our own families and, and et cetera. So in a sense, what's your, what would be a message? Uh, what is something that, that you would like to pass on? Simple message is try to spend as much of your time as possible on things that you're intensely passionate about. There's no there's no way to spend 100% of your time on it because there's always stuff that gets in the way. There's always things you got to deal with. There's always just the overhead of life. There's always projects that somehow you get involved in that you're not that excited about. Yeah. Work as hard as you can to spend all of your time on things that you're incredibly passionate about. Don't waste any of your life because it's over before we know it. And if you want to be a leader, you want to be a great entrepreneur, you want to just have a happy life, spend time doing stuff, being with people that you want, and recognize that failure is part of that, ups and downs are part of that, sickness, death, uh, unhappiness, strife, that's all just part of life. And so try to stack the deck in your favor by <laughs> spending time on things that you really care about. That's my best advice. Oh, that, that, that's fantastic, Brad. Uh, perfect.